Welcome to Pioneer Network. Uh, my name is Mike Marr. Uh, we're going over, this very well could be the last day of, of teaching from church history. We're going to get through the point where we're talking about really the beginning of the, of the uh, Pentecostal charismatic movement here in the United States. But to get started, I want to kind of go over some things, um, just kind of go back one point. Uh, and if you haven't been here last week, I know we have a couple people here in the room, Marjolene is here. Uh, I can talk with you about uh, where we got last week and get you up to steam. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can always e email us at info at the pioneer network dot, uh, org. I think it is. It'll be up on the screen here. There it is. Info at the pioneer network dot, org. Um, if you have any questions, feedback, want to get tied in. Uh, if you want to start a uh, semester next, next semester coming up sometime in October, uh, just let us know. But I want to move back. Uh, we were talking about how the Reformation started in Europe. Uh, and, and we talked about Calvin and Zwingli and Luther and Huss and uh, all those guys who wanted to try to, to bring the Catholic Church back to the Scripture. And the Catholic Church didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, eventually, they realized that they weren't going to be able to bring the Catholic Church back. Um, uh, Calvin particularly had no interest in the, Cal the, the Catholic Church at all. Uh, he didn't care about Rome. He didn't want Rome. He saw Rome as a very negative um, fixture, and he wasn't interested in fixing it. He said beyond salvage, let's move on and start our own deal. Uh, so, so Calvin started his thing in Switzerland, or actually they took him to Switzerland, and uh, that was somewhat of a disaster. Uh, I, I tell people all the time that people that may interpret scripture well don't necessarily have uh, their lives all put together. Uh, and Calvin had some definite problems. Uh, Luther had a problem where he was really racist towards the Jewish people. Uh, Calvin uh, was really sort of a black and white kind of guy, but not even sort of, he was black and white. So if you didn't see it Calvin's way, uh, you were going to, you're going to pay for it. Uh, so uh, that was all kind of fomenting in, in the uh, European area. And then we know who the Puritans are, the, uh, the, the, the pilgrims. Uh, they were first in England uh, and they didn't want to be a part of the Church of England. The Church of England was trying to push them into their mold. So they left England and went to, to uh, the Netherlands, to, to Holland. And um, they ran into some problems there too, where the kids were starting to learn the language, learn the customs, and they realized that they were becoming, well, Dutch. And they didn't want that either. So they actually chartered their way onto to, uh, to a ship and made their way across the uh, Atlantic to the colonies to start anew. And they, the thought was, is they would start a whole new nation. They would start a community that was specifically uh, reformed and biblical and didn't have any of the ties to Rome or the, the Anglican Church or the Church of England or the Lutheran Church or any of that. They were specifically just Puritans. Uh, and it didn't work out so well. Uh, whenever I, I, I tell people over and over again, whenever you, uh, whenever you mix the politics and, 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 and church together, it sullies the church. Uh, and and there's, there's some things we could go through this evening why I think that works. But that's what was happening. They were trying to set something up new in this new world. And they had this idea how perfect it was going to be. So the move to America started with the Puritans. And then after the Puritans got established and more and more people were coming to the colonies, uh, evangelists started coming over as well. And the two most important ones that uh, got started were George Whitfield and John Wesley. And uh, Whitfield was very Calvinistic. Uh, uh, Wesley was very Arminian. Uh, but the neat thing about these two guys, which is unusual for today, is they were actually really good friends. They had very different theologies, very different doctrines, but they found ways to work together and actually had a very deep friendship that they had between the two of them. Uh, the most of, of what you see from Whitfield and, and Wesley uh, is still now in the Methodist tradition. And uh, the Methodist tradition pretty much went almost entirely with Wesley. And a lot of the Calvinistic uh, backgrounds uh, from, from uh, Whitfield have been lost. Uh, so most of the, the Methodist church is more on the Arminian side of the spectrum. So if you're looking at, at church denominations, the big ones that came over to the United States, uh, there were really three. Uh, there were the Methodists, there were the Baptists, and there were the Congregationalists. Now, this isn't in your notes, so if you're taking notes, the three big ones to start out were the, the Methodists, the Baptists, and uh, the, um, the, the, or the, the Congregationalists. And really, out of the Congregationalists is where the Presbyterians come from. So this is all kind of going on in the, in the colonies, but there's not um, a really strong church presence. Now, a lot of us have this idea that the beginning of the United States uh, was, was like uh, heaven on earth. And it was like everyone was saved, everyone was in church, 
the churches were strong and they were teaching doctrine. It just really wasn't the case. There were a lot of problems in, in the colonies. There wasn't a good systematic theology that brought it all together. Well, enter um, the next thing you may have studied in, in high school. It's called the Awakenings. It was the first great awakening and the second great awakening. And, and what these were, these were revivals that happened in the United States in the 1600s and the 1700s. And the first one, the first great awakening was really centered around one guy whose name was Jonathan Edwards. He was the one that kind of got a lot of the stuff going. And, and the interesting thing about the revivals and the first great awakening was this. They didn't go to tent meetings. They didn't have great big programs. They didn't have, uh, it wasn't advertised that this is a revival. What happened was all up and down the Eastern seaboard, all through the colonies uh, in churches, the Holy Spirit was moving in the congregations and people were being saved. And the interesting thing is, is the first great awakening had these, these, these four characteristics. It was number one, heavily charismatic or, or Calvinistic, uh, which is kind of backwards when you think about it, because most of the Calvinists that you run in today are not very interested in evangelism, it doesn't seem. Uh, they don't really get excited about tent meetings. They don't get excited about going out and meeting people in the street and meeting them where they are and presenting the gospel to them. Now, maybe that's an unfair assessment of, of, of reformed Calvinistic people today. However, it seems like that's the mold that it fits, and there's some sociological reasons for that, possibly. Um, if you're really content with where you are, you don't have a desire to change the status quo, the way things are. So you tend to sit exactly where you are. Uh, the more uh, dissatisfied you are with the world around you, the more likely it is that you want to go out and change it. Well, for the most part, the Calvinists of today are your more affluent people. They're not really interested in changing the status quo. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are frustrated today because the status quo is changing without them, and they want it to go back to the way it was before. Uh, but back in the First Great Awakening, the Calvinists weren't necessarily your uppity-ups, and they were interested in making things change. So they were out there evangelizing people. They were out there uh, touching people's lives. And the Holy Spirit was, was, was cooperating in all that, and people were being changed. And they were changing from the ground up. It wasn't just an emotional appeal. Uh, these people were, were changing how they were living their lives. They were getting involved in ministry, and they were getting involved in church. So it was a ground-up, grassroots kind of revival. The second thing is it was around a guy named Jonathan Edwards. If you ever want to read something. Now, it, it's funny, Scott and I have conversations. I think one of the greatest sermons ever getting, given was a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And that has a really bad title. It doesn't sound like a, a good sermon, but if you were to go ahead and read uh, the, the, the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, it's public domain. You can go online and find it. Uh, that was indicative of the kind of sermons that Jonathan Edwards was preaching. And the thing of it was, if you were to preach that sermon today in church, you may get run out on a pole. Uh, but when Edwards was preaching it, people were falling out in the aisles. They were, they were struck by the, the, the sense of the gospel and, and God's both grace and God's wrath. Uh, so that was the second thing. The other interesting thing about the First Great Awakening was the scope. It wasn't limited just to Jonathan Edwards' congregation. Uh, I don't know if any of you were ever uh, involved with or, or saw the Brownsville revival. I mean, it was in Brownsville. And it may have had little fingers that made their, its way out through, through, uh, through Florida. And people from all around the country were going to Brownsville. But things weren't changing in individual churches because of Brownsville. But in the First Great Awakening, no matter where you were in a church, the revival was happening. It was happening all through the colonies, from the south all the way up to the north from New England. Um, the third or fourth thing is its influence. Um, the First Great Awakening influenced the government. It changed the way... Uh, politicians thought mainly because politicians were getting saved and being revived. Uh, it changed the economy of, of the place. It changed the theology a lot of times for, for people. It, it grew churches and it changed communities. The scope was amazing and the influence was amazing. Uh, so you compare that to the second great awakening. And a lot of this I don't have written a whole lot of down, but um, I've got the, the key points. Uh, the big guy that started out in the second great awakening was a guy named Azahel Nettleton. Azahel Nettleton was traditionally a, a Calvinistic uh, theology kind of guy. Uh, he believed in what we call the old lights. Now, when you look down, you see Finney. Uh, he believed in the new lights. So there was a different kind of way of doing things that was coming up that was starting with, with Finney that Nettleton didn't have. Nettleton was very dry. 
he was very monotone. He wasn't, uh, he didn't inspire a lot of emotional response. Uh, he, he did things the old traditional way. Uh, he did expositional preaching and that was it. You either got it or you didn't get it. Uh, he was heavily charismatic or, or Calvinistic. He wasn't charismatic at all. He was Calvinistic and he was very, very, very intellectual. Now with all that still, people were coming to Christ in his meetings. Now, if, if you looked at a Nettleton uh, revival meeting, you had maybe 80 to 100 people in a room, and, and people were being touched and changed in that 80 to 100 people. Then the other guy was a guy named Charles Finney. And Finney uh, and Nettleton corresponded back and forth between each other, um, and they didn't really care much for each other. Uh, I think Finney, in a lot of ways, if you read his systematic theology, which is a, is a, is a read I would recommend that you do, if you want to understand church history and American theology. Um, but Finney's theology was almost in every point that Nettleton believed, Finney's theology was opposed to. And a lot of, a lot of historians, a lot of church historians, feel that, that Finney just resented the old established church. He didn't like what it stood for. He didn't like how boring it was. Uh, he didn't like them telling him what, what to believe. Finney was, was trained in, in, in law. He was a lawyer. And he basically approached the, the Calvinistic ways and the theologies with a lawyer surgeon or, or surgical kind of precision of a lawyer. And he took it apart. Uh, he didn't like anything of it. And, and he, he opposed it in every point. And Finney instituted what we refer to as the new lights. Uh, that would be different ways of presenting evangelism. So whereas Nettleton was very traditional, very staid, very intellectual, very charismatic, Finney, on the other hand, uh, would do just about anything to get his point across. Uh, we were in a, a church meeting, and I think Scott was with us, and, uh, and and one of the guys that we were talking to, and they're talking about how they put their service together, he said, I will do anything at all if I think it'll bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ. I, I, I don't care if we're, we're only covered in shaving cream or we're naked on the stage. We will do whatever we have to do to get the message of the gospel across. Nettleton would never do that. Finney, on the other hand, had that approach. He said, we will do whatever it takes. We will use whatever we, tools we have in, in our hands to bring the gospel to people and bring it in such a way where they'll be convicted. Uh, some of the things that they brought in um, was, was what they referred to as the seat of unction. Um, and I think we have a little bit of that still left in the church. Um, I don't know if we do it the way Nettle or the way Finney did it, but they would actually set a chair up in front of the, the people and have a person sit in the chair and people who knew about what this person had done, their sins and their shortcomings, would list them out. And everyone would raise this great cry, and they would come around them, and they'd be praying for this person. And, and it really brought a lot of emotional um, and social pressure on the person who was in the seat of function. Uh, it was very effective to convince people to get out of their sin. Uh, the question was whether it was actually effective in the long run, and we'll kind of get to that. Um, the third thing that was indicative of Finney's uh, ministry in the Second Great Awakening, it was highly emotional. Uh, Finney knew how to whip up a crowd and get them all excited. He knew how to, to elicit an emotional response out of people. Nettleton apparently didn't have a clue about it. If he did, he wouldn't do it anyway, because that's not the way that he approached people's hearts. Um, Finney, on the other hand, said, hey, listen, we're going to get that emotional appeal. We're going to go ahead and get the stir of the spirit of the and get a move. Now, there, there's some advantages to that, and, and I think it's a more balanced approach uh, to take a little bit of, of, of Nettleton and a little bit of Finney, and then find out what your mix may happen to, because being entirely intellectual, I don't think gets to the heart of the person. So I think Finney had a legitimate point in, in raising the emotionalism up a little bit. Uh, however, some of the things that they ended up doing during their, their service um, were a little bit questionable. Uh, I think that goes to our next our next point uh, here that we can, we can bring up. The second great awakening. Let's see if I can really do it. <laughs> I've lost control of my screen. So while I'm trying to get that back, um, some of the things that Nettleton or that Finney would end up doing is he would actually use um, uh, potentially vulgarity in the uh, during his his worship services to shock people out of their complacency. Uh, he would use uh, really interesting metaphors and illustrations to get people to see the point that he was trying to get across. Um, Finney's crowds, as opposed to Nettleton's, uh, were very large. Uh, they were almost like a Billy Graham kind of a feel that he had. Uh, they weren't as big as that because they didn't have uh, 
they didn't have sound equipment to be able to broadcast uh, across an entire stadium. Uh, but Finney much more was, I guess, what we would call the modern evangelist, uh, whereas uh, Nettleton was not. Um, that brings us here. Um, the new evangelism that, that Finney was espousing um, is a whatever it takes method took hold. Uh, so whatever it took, it didn't matter what they had to do to get the point across, they did it. And they had much larger meetings. Now these are not in your in your notes, uh, but if you want to if you want to get a sense of what Finney's theology was really like, there were a couple things that that Finney um, rebelled against against the more charismatic or the Calvinistic reform teachings that I think he went a little too far. But one of the things that that Finney doesn't agree with is the concept of imputed righteousness. What imputed righteousness says is this: that when you become saved, when Christ enters into your life you accept him as, as your savior, that what he had done in his life is given to you. So when God looks at you, he's not looking at your old actions at all. Those have been taken away. He's looking at what Christ has done and how Christ is, uh, is, is his righteousness is given to you. Now, Finney on the other hand said, there is no way that another man's righteousness can be given to somebody else. And that includes Jesus. So he said that, that, that salvation is dependent upon three things. Uh, faith, repentance, and good works. Uh, and, and that was, I think, a little bit too far. Uh, it throws away the, the, the idea of grace and how God imputes righteousness to us, and it puts our salvation completely in our hands. Now, this isn't a doctrine class. We're, we're talking about church history, but I want to I draw the, the difference between where we used to be as a nation, which was heavily reformed. Uh, all the churches were that way. We're right along when Finney came along, Finney made so much of an inroad into the, the theology and through the evangelism that he changed the, uh, the theological landscape of the nation uh, with him. Now, um, before we go on and we look at, 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 at the, the Pentecostal movement, which is kind of coming out of Finney's um, influence, I, I want to I bring one point out. Um, the difference between Nettleton's revivals and Finney's revivals were pretty strong. Um, Finney was was the, was the end of the the first the second great awakening. Nettleton was the beginning. Nettleton's meetings were much smaller, much tighter knit group of people, and uh, he in, he uh, influenced them primarily intellectually and not so much emotionally. Uh, Finney didn't ra- really have a huge intellectual um, impact on the people. A lot of emotionalism, um, and when when Finney was was revisiting the places that he went to in his his. Uh, evangelistic crusades, uh, his followers realized something, that very, 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 very few of the people that they evangelized were still involved in the church at all. That for the most part, most of the people that they had touched uh, have, had already left the faith and had, had been off on their own and were unchurched, undisciplined, and not involved in ministry. Nettleton, on the other hand, uh, when he went back through his people, he found that most of them were still heavily involved in ministry, were still tied in with the church, and we're doing God's work. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that was part of Finney's crew was gone, but what I'm saying is that perhaps Nettleton's numbers that he had in those small group meetings that stayed were about the same numbers of what Finney had in the big meetings. So Finney made about the same amount of impact on the people that he was he was evangelizing. However, he left a whole lot of people that he had touched before out of the church. So they had about the same net result Nettleton and, and, and Finney did, but there was less of the falling away with, with Nettleton, if you follow what I mean. So if, if Nettleton went to a town and he got 10 converts, uh, uh, Finney would have gone to a town and gotten 1,000 converts, and after 10 years, it would be 10 left. So they still both had 10. It's just, how did they get there? Uh, and that has an import to us in, in, in church, I think, for us to say, let's take a balanced approach to how we approach um, evangelism. Uh, the next point uh, we're getting into the Pentecostal movement. So um, we're talking about Crete Azusa. Azusa was a, an area in the San Francisco part, or is it Los Angeles? Scott, was it San Francisco or Los Angeles, Azusa? It was LA. So um, Azusa is a part of, of Los Angeles out in California. Uh, before them, though, there was a beginning of a thing called the Holiness Movement. Uh, the Holiness Movement, the roots were in the Methodist Church. So coming out of the, the Wesleyan theology, uh, that, that's where the, the holiness came. They believed several things. Number one, they believed in the second act of grace. Um, what the second act of grace is, if you haven't been involved in the holiness church, it says 
that the first act of grace is get you saved. But the second act of grace is when you grow more and more in Christ's likeness and you sin less and less and less and less. Uh, that leads to point C. We are saved and then we kill the sin nature. Um, and lastly, it is possible to be completely without sin. So it th th didn't all start all at once. Wesley didn't teach uh, per se the holiness movement, but the holiness movement grew out of some of his theology and some of his evangelism. But what, what it gets to is this, that you can be saved but you can lose your salvation. And the way you don't lose your salvation is you continually grow more and more in the likeness of Christ. And as you grow more and more in the likeness of Christ, you sin less and less and less till you get to the point where you can actually live a sinless life. Um, I personally have some issues with that theology. I think what it does is it makes you a slave to your own appetites. Uh, there was one guy who came to college, uh, to Bible college, and he actually got up in front of a, a whole group of Reformed uh, theology students and he said, I haven't sinned in six years. And there was all kind of this inward take of, of breath, like, oh, he's done it now. And interestingly enough, we found out about three or four months later, he had been living with his mistress for the past 10 years or so. So even while he was saying he was living sinless, he was actually living in sin. And the, the sin came out and it destroyed his ministry. Um, I haven't found a person yet, myself included, that is living a sinless life. Uh, there's only one person I know that did that, and, and they put him on a tree for it, and he rose from the dead. That's the only one I know who lived a sinless life. I think it's dangerous for us to take this theology too seriously. Um, so the, the holiness movement got going, saying you can actually become holy on your own. Uh, enter a guy named William Seymour, a really interesting guy. If there's someone I would like to meet after I die and go to heaven, William Seymour is probably one of those guys I would really like to talk to. Um, he was an interesting guy. He was born in Louisiana to ex-slaves. Uh, he moved to Indianapolis and to Cincinnati and started his education uh, trying to become a pastor. He was in the Midwest when in January 1, Agnes Osmond spoke in tongues when he was there. And he became uh, convinced that this is the way that, that the church needs to go, that the Holy Spirit is breaking out in, in places. And these spiritual gifts, which have been dormant and suppressed by the church for years, are starting to bubble up now. And, and come up through the, the mainline denomination. He was a contemporary with a guy named Charles Parham. Uh, Parham was uh, really the, the beginning of the guy for the Assemblies of God movement. If you look at the Assemblies of God and the Church of God, uh, there were several things that, that he really had that were hallmarks to the Assemblies of God denominations that we have today. The, the, the Probably the, the one that his thumbprint is on the most is the idea that the first evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. That was a, a legacy of, of Charles Parlin. Um, so William Seymour got to meet Charles Parlin and was, was influenced by him. William Seymour went to college um, and, and was taking Bible college courses, but at this point still, the American church was racially segregated. So what, what William Seymour had to do, and this is why I respect him so much, is he wasn't allowed in the classroom, so he sat outside in the hallway, out the door of the classroom, taking notes and listening to the lecturer as they were giving lectures. Now, to me, that says something about the character of a person when they're not allowed in the room at all, but they'll sit out in the hallway and listen to a, a teacher who doesn't view you as a human being or as good a human being as the white people that are sitting in the classroom. So William Seymour sits out in the hallway, listens to this light, white lecturer teaching on the Bible and, and is taking notes down so he can be um, a pastor or a minister in the church. If you want to really understand and, and be under a, a humble person who's a servant of God, look for a guy like William Seymour. Now, William Seymour wasn't without his faults as well, but look for a guy like William Seymour who is willing to take that kind of humiliation and that kind of judgment and still say, you know what, I'm still going to listen and hear what this person has to say and, and submit to it. So he gets done with his, his outside the hallway classroom education. He goes to L.A. to start a church. Well, he got there, and at first he was he was welcomed by some folks. Uh, there was Julia Hutchins who had a small church, and he was welcomed in by by Julia, but don't know exactly why what he was preaching that got her upset. But uh, she threw him out. So what he did is he started meeting at Edward Lee's house, and they just met inside the house, but the, the house was too small. So they, they they had meetings inside the house, and people would be out on the porch. Um, or actually, I'm sorry, the men and were and then they moved, I'm sorry, to Asbury's, a place on Asbury's whose porch collapsed under the weight of all the people. So moved from Edward Lee's to a place called Asbury's, 
and they were meeting out of the porch and so many people were out there that the, the, the underpinnings for the porch collapsed. Eventually they moved to Azusa Street and they started preaching there. So Azusa was an old, um, in, a, in an old AME church, it was in poor repair. Uh, the meetings were continuous. They didn't have like Sunday church. They were there all the time. It was kind of like the International House of Prayer. And here were the distinctives. They spoke in tongues, people were slain in the spirits, they were exuberant, in other words, they were emotional. Uh, they integrated praise music and preaching, which was new to the church, which is kind of like what a lot of the contemporary churches are doing now. Even the churches that are more uh, reformed in nature. If you're here in the Auburn, Opelika area, uh, there's a place called Auburn Community Church. It's a very big church. Uh, it has reformed distinctives about it. The pastor's name is, is Miles Fidel. Um, it has all the trappings of, of being what you would call a, a contemporary church, a, a modern church. Uh, it's still being reformed, but they have the praise music, and they integrate with the, the teaching, so it looks a lot like a Susan did, and yet it's a mainline church that came out of the, uh, the Methodist church, the church here, First Assembly, uh, with Scott and Scott Bryant. Uh, we do the same thing. We have praise music that starts the, the worship, and then we have preaching, and we have interaction and such, very much like what the Azusa meetings are uh, or were. Uh, some of the things that we saw out of Azusa, um, there were some uh, there were some problems. Uh, first of all, the church was completely undisciplined. Uh, there was no control of the people necessarily. You knew you never knew what you were going to see. Uh, it was prone to excesses. In other words, there were people there were people people would be doing things that they shouldn't be doing. It's kind of like the the Corinthian church in a lot of ways. I had a lack of teaching in basic doctrine. They they spent so much of their time. Um, in the praise and the worship of being in the moment and experiencing the gifts of the Spirit, but they didn't spend a lot of time teaching the people basic doctrine. And quite honestly, it may be that there wasn't a lot of interest in the church or training in the church where they understood basic doctrine. So a lot of problems started because of that. Some of the positive results is they integrated the poor and the wealthy both. Uh, uh, William Seymour's church in Azusa got rid of the dividing lines, the socioeconomic dividing lines. Uh, so, so in other churches, all the rich people went to one church, all the poor people went to the other. Uh, Susan, on the other hand, cut through all those differences and integrated all that together. We don't know how they did it except to, to say the Holy Spirit did. Uh, they integrated uh, ethnic groups. So it wasn't just all white people and it wasn't just black people. Uh, the, the, the move of a Susan was completely interracial, interethnic, uh, and intersocioeconomic, which was really neat. Uh, the other thing they did is they integrated women into service in the church, which wasn't being done uh, in churches up to that point. So there were some really good things that happened um, in Azusa. Um, some of the things, if you if you take church history about the Assemblies of God that you learned about, uh, when the Assemblies of God first started, they inherited the Azusa model, uh, but they, they ran into problems. Uh, they ran into problems because pastors were teaching things that weren't consistent from one, one church to the other. Then there were people, pastors that were doing things that were just completely undisciplined and, and non-biblical. Uh, one of the guys that, that really kind of moved the Assemblies of God into having uh, some structure and some discipline inside the church, some, some uh, disciplinary actions, was Jimmy Swagger. Uh, Jimmy Swagger did some things that were just, just wrong. They were just absolutely wrong. Um, and the Assemblies of God recognized the fact that the, the pastors, without accountability and without discipline over them, could end up doing uh, a lot of damage to the faith. So what churches started doing after Azusa came up is they started the churches that were charismatic and Pentecostal said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually put pastors and bishops and elders and we're going to put boards on top of folks and we're going to say, you have to maintain a certain level of decorum. Uh, you have to maintain a certain level of doctrinal purity uh, and also moral behavior. You can't be out doing things that are morally wrong. It's not to say that the church is perfect on that. Uh, this church still has moments when they turn a blind eye to someone who's doing something wrong, mainly because that person was influential or they had a large congregation. But by and large, uh, those really are things of the past. Uh, the church has done its best to, to uh, discipline. So that gets us up not to necessarily where we're at today with all the different denominations. That would take a lot more time to track out all the different denominations since there's close to 20,000 denominations in the world in general. Um, but that gets us up close to where we're at today. Um, and so here's what we're going to do. Um, we've got this outline together. And what I would like to do, if you want to go ahead and, and kind of put together everything that you've talked about,
I would like you to email me at the email that's on the, uh, the screen right now, info at pioneernetwork.org. And we'll set up a telephone uh, conversation, maybe do something with a Zoom link or a Google, uh, Google uh, meeting place or something like that. And we'll do what amounts to an oral conversation back and forth and maybe set some time up where you could write an essay and say, okay, here's how I see the flow of church history. You can start uh, all the way back in Genesis or you can pick up at the time of Jesus or you can pick up at the time of Rome, whichever one you want to do. But basically what I've done is, is we've outlined church history from uh, Genesis up to the uh, beginning of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. Uh, one thing I want to leave you with is this, the, the thread that I kind of look at when I'm looking at church. Um, there's a guy whose name, his last name is Rush Jr., John Rossus Rush Jr. Uh, he wrote a book that really made a big impact on me on how I look at the church. The book is called The Mythology of Science. And, and Rush Jr. develops two themes inside this book, uh, the, the, the uh, mythology of science. He, he develops the idea of a myth, and he develops the idea of magic. Uh, a myth, what a myth does, it's a story that helps us understand the world around us. It explains the world so we can figure it out and live our lives in it. Uh, magic, on the other hand, what it does is it has a, a power and a force that changes the world for us into what we want to see it as. See it as. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem. That's a, a, a fight that's inside us all the time. One half of us just wants to make sense of the world, and the other half wants to control the world. If the church is set up where what it does is explain the world, that's a, that's a myth, right? And I'm not meaning myth as fact that it's, it's something that's not factual. It's something that explains the world so we can understand it and live inside it. If the church, on the other hand, wants to control the world and change it, that's magic. Uh, the, the flow through church history that I'm very careful with is this. Do not change the church into something that magically tries to control the world around you. Have the church so it constantly explains the world around you so you understand how you can live inside the world. The problem that we had with the, with the Jewish faith is it wanted to use magic to control it. It had the law and it had the edge about the law. If you did all these things the right way, everything was going to be great for you. That was a problem because God doesn't really work that way. He says, I don't want you to control the world. I want you to understand it and, and become a part of it the way I designed it. Uh, the problem with uh, some of the churches in the early church was they had lost the, the first love, the love of being with Christ. And they started trying to, to reshape morality so it fit what they wanted. That was a problem. Paul dealt with that in Corinthians and, and Ephesians and Colossians. Uh, the problem with Rome, the problem with Rome is it wanted to control things. We changed from a faith that was martyred for its, its or a people that was martyred for their faith into a, a people that would kill people if they didn't agree with their faith. Uh, so the problem that Rome ran into under, you know, started with Constantine, I believe. Well, some Constantine's fault, it was the churches, is thinking it would control the world around it instead of merely explaining the world and learning how to live with it. So you see this, this, this flow through all of church history. When the church starts to try to control the world around us, bad things happen. We lose our, our, our focus on who Christ is. If, on the other hand, the church's job is to explain the world around us so we understand who is God, who are we, and what is our place in the world, and how do we, how do we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, that's when things work well. William Seymour, when he was, when he was uh, in, in the church and he was experiencing the spiritual gifts, he wasn't trying to control the world around him. He was trying to have the mythology, the understanding, the story of how the Holy Spirit is interacting with the world and join the Holy Spirit in that. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's explaining the world and joining it and joining what God's doing and working inside. On the other hand, if we start using the spiritual gifts to change the world for us, to make us more comfortable, uh, to make us more acceptable, uh, that's where the problems are. And that's where a lot of theologies come into a problem is when we start manipulating what God's plan is to make our lives easier or make our lives more comfortable. The truth of it is, is all through church history, what we see is this that God is explaining himself to us and the world to us. And our job is to listen and to conform ourselves to it. So once again, this is the end of this class. Uh, we will go through um, uh, any contacts you have with me and talk about essays and, and discussions to see what you got out of it. Email to info at the Pioneer Network. Um, we'll, we'll go take a short break and Scott will come up and he'll do his segment on the five songs. Good night and God bless.